I honestly don't know how it works in other countries, but here in Italy for each apartment block there's an administrator who organizes general meetings and manages all the paperwork. Now, imagine a condominium. A big condominium with 193 families that every year, as in all condos, gather in an assembly. They discuss and approve budgets, vote for their chairman, argue and complain to each other about their neighbors. But this assembly has some peculiarities. In fact, every decision approved here is in no way binding. Even if you convince the entire building that your neighbor, Mr. City of Pistoia, has taken too many liberties in the use of common spaces, nothing can stop him from carrying on as he pleases. Only community decisions regarding formal and bureaucratic matters, expenses and budgets have any validity. After all, that's what counts. Money is no joke. And you know how it goes. No one rejoices at the idea of being administrator and president of an apartment block. Add another element. In addition to this assembly, there's another, more restricted and bending one. A council whose authority, with all due respect to Mr. Pistoia, is not in question. There are 10 families, established by the assembly, which alternate for the next two years, but to these another five families are added, and these always have their place in the council. They will say that they built the building and therefore, well, they own it. These are very special guys, so special that these five do not even trust each other. They have studied a mechanism according to which even if one of them is against the resolution, the resolution itself can be blocked. This means that if one of them, let's say Mr. Vladimir, decides to park his new flaming car in front of the garage of another of his colleague, Mr. Volodymyr, this council cannot do anything, because any decision would require the favorable vote of Mr. Vladimir himself. Now, replace condominium with the UN, family units with states, Mr. Pistoia with any forgotten country, awesome car with Russian tank, and we're already well on our way. As for Mr. Vladimir and Mr. Volodymyr, there's no need to change anything. We need to get straight to the question of the day. What's wrong with the UN? On the one hand, we have become accustomed to the idea that the decisions that count are always taken by the usual five, the so-called permanent members of the UN – USA, Russia, France, UK and the People's Republic of China. This is the exclusive group, the private party that can always get away with it. There are proposals for a Security Council more representative of the world population, or suggestions to extend the permanent seat to Brazil, India and Germany or even to turn the French seat into a larger EU seat. But for the moment we have to make do with the compromise of the non-permanent members, provided that your country is lucky enough to end up there at the right time. This doesn't undermine the fact that there's a considerable gap between the competencies of the Assembly and those of the Council, the only body that can deliberate sanctions, embargoes and even military actions against possible aggressors. It is true, however, that according to the Article 27 of the UN Charter, two different majorities are established each time depending on two types of issues to be submitted to the vote of the Council. There are procedural matters, there is the formal ones, that establish the course of the session, which require the favorable votes of at least nine members, both permanent and non-permanent. And then there are the decisions on any other matter, which always require a majority of nine votes, including those of the five permanent members. In a certain respect, Article 27 recognizes the superiority of some states over all the others. And here we already have a first jarring note. It is up to the Council alone, or rather to the five permanent members, to establish what is a threat to peace, an aggression or an act of conquest. In some cases there's not much to discuss, such as the invasion of Kuwait in 1991 by Saddam's Iraq. On that occasion resolutions were issued by calling for the withdrawal of Iraqi troops imposing sanctions and finally with resolution 678 authorizing the use of force to impose Iraqi withdrawal. But it doesn't always work smoothly, see what happened in Bosnia and Somalia. In a sense, rather than banning wars, the Security Council is the only body that can recognize a state's right to wage wars. Things would become much more complicated if the bad guy was one of the five permanent members. And here we have the second and main problem, the so-called vetoes. 
Actually, the power of veto is not explicitly mentioned in the UN Charter, and it's not a veto in a strict sense. According to the already mentioned Article 27, for all the issues that are not procedural, therefore issues related to peace, conflict resolution, sanctions and even the entry of countries in the UN, the nine minimum votes in favour must include the approval of all the five permanent members, and therefore the contrary vote of one of them implicitly becomes a kind of veto. In reality, the negative opinion of one of the five members cannot block the deliberation from the beginning, as a pure veto right would allow, but it can only make it void during the voting phase. Similarly, even the non-permanent members enjoy, in theory, a similar power, the so-called block veto. Even if all the five permanent members vote in favour, there would still be four votes missing to reach a majority of nine, and if the non-permanent members would unite to vote against the five other permanent members, well, the party is compromised. For convenience, as everyone does, I will call this prerogative by the term veto, even though it would be a misnomer for some lawyers. We would then have the paradox of an aggressor country sitting comfortably on its seat in the council that find itself having to vote on the resolution condemning its own actions. In your opinion, Will this nation block itself with its veto, or will it play dumb and forget to vote against it? The answer is pretty clear. Yet, such rebel nation must still participate in the discussion, at least to get the scolding from the other four. This veto non veto game has already been abused in the 70s by the five UN members, so nothing shocking. It was the Soviet Union that got into right away. However, Stalin, in his infinite wisdom, decided to boycott the sessions of the Council when its members continued to recognize Taiwan rather than Mao's China. In the meantime, in 1950, North Korea had invaded South Korea, and the Security Council, taking advantage of the Soviet absence, approved resolutions on which the Soviet Union would certainly have vetoed. From that moment onwards, the Soviet Union didn't skip any sessions and put its veto on everything possible. But don't worry, the other four didn't stand by and watch. United Kingdom and France used the right of veto for the first time in 1956, during the Suez Crisis that saw them involved, together with Israel, in the military occupation of the Canal against Egypt. Then, in the 70s, it was the turn of the United States, which exercised its right of veto mainly in defense of Israel from the risk of sanctions. The USSR loved the use of the veto so much that Ambassador Andrei Gromyko earned the nickname of Mr. Nyet, Mr. No, while Vyacheslav Molotov got the nickname of Mr. Veto. Anyway, we did the math for you. The veto right has been exercised 263 times, sometimes by several members together, for 213 rejected resolutions. Russia USSR for 120 times, then US at 82, United Kingdom 29, France 16 and China 16. The veto right has often been used as a kind of protection for one's own interests, something that has little to do with achieving peace and harmony, and that's the contradiction. The UN is supposed to be an equal organization, yet five countries can block everything. And okay, these five countries are the winners of World War II, but can France and UK still be considered great powers as in the 18th century? At the time, it was Roosevelt who named four policemen to ensure peace in the world. The three war winners plus the Republic of China, despite the fact that the latter was in a political crisis. All of these according to a concept that was actually very close to the classic divisions by spheres of influence. And let's take into account that dozens and dozens of vetoes have been used not to prevent international crisis, but to hinder the appointment of general secretaries and worse, to prevent the entry of some states into the UN. Let's take an example. The People's Republic of China replaced the Taiwanese in 1971 and immediately used vetoes to prevent the entry of Bangladesh and other countries that were still recognizing Taiwan. We Italians managed to enter the UN only in 1955 due to vetoes placed by the Soviet Union. This management system thus seems to grant the five powerful permanent members that no decisions they don't like will ever be effective. The veto power somehow implies that nothing can be done without the total willingness of the big five. Basically, the world cannot be at peace 
if the big five are not at peace. The underlying assumptions of the veto mechanism thus seems to be that world order is not possible if the big five don't agree altogether. As if to say, if sanctions on Lukashenko may upset one of us, who knows who, with the risk of creating tensions between us, then better not to sanction him at all. Rather than a real blockade, some see the veto as a sort of prevention, a collective mechanism. It's a way to ensure that a conflict doesn't break out among the five permanent members, which apparently is the most important thing for our global stability. There are also those who argue that the absence of the veto would create more instability, and so it would be right to keep such veto. Vetoes proved their validity only in cases of narrow interest to the Council itself, and most of the times vetoes weren't used to meet humanitarian demands or to put an end to international conflicts. And so Russia vetoed the resolution to open an investigation into the Malaysian Airlines accident in Donbass, as well as the condemnation for the annexation of Crimea. Russia also vetoed, together with China, the resolutions against the Assad regime in Syria in 2011 and 2012, just as on the other side, the US vetoed the recognition of the genocide in Rwanda. In addition to this, many says that the continued US vetoes against sanctions targeting Israel are contributing to exacerbate relations with the Palestinians. Mentioning Syria, aside from Russia and Iran, the big allies who have supported its bombings and attacks, the US, Saudi Arabia, the Emirates and Turkey have also been part of the clashes. And just as Russia has violated the UN Charter by bombing the Aleppo region and hundreds of civilian targets, as well as approving the use of chemical weapons by the Assad regime, Obama's and Trump's US did the same thing. By launching more than 50 Tomahawk cruise missiles on Syria, the Americans bypassed the constraints of the UN Charter that limit the use of force in international affairs. And in the end, the UN Security Council still can't agree on a joint agreement on Syria. Russia has repeatedly blocked negotiations moved by the other three Western nations. For their own part, the United Kingdom, France and the US have done the same with the Russian demands, calling them excessive and unacceptable. And so, the endless game continues. So it's pretty normal to expect that a council structured in this way is going to be unable to take action in conflicts of global dimensions, right? Because such conflicts may involve a permanent member. For days, the UN members have been discussing a possible suspension or expulsion of Russia from the UN and the Security Council, in order to bypass its veto in the resolutions concerning Ukraine. Beside the fact that the possible veto of China would still remain, it's really possible to exclude Russia. A first step has already been taken in this sense, with the suspension of Moscow from the UN Human Rights Council at least until 2023, an action made possible by the decision of the General Assembly alone. Only Libya suffered a similar fate in 2011, but here with Russia we are dealing with a member of the Council. Beyond its symbolic significance, this measure denies Russia the possibility to propose resolutions and amendments in situations in which it's not directly involved. However, suspending Russia from the UN and therefore from the Security Council is more complicated and, according to many analysts, actually impossible. According to Article 5, the Assembly could decide with two-thirds of votes in favour the suspension of a UN country, but only against those countries towards which the Security Council has initiated proceedings. In other words, it's necessary to ask Russia first if it's okay to be suspended. Then it was also discussed the very borderline hypothesis of denying the Russian delegation the credentials to represent its country, from documentation to the recognition of its delegates. This is a procedure that is normally implemented for those countries where a coup d'etat or a civil war undermines the legitimacy of the government and consequently the UN delegation. This happened recently in the cases of Afghanistan, Myanmar and Cambodia in 1997. However, Russia doesn't have a similar situation, but it's clear that the intervention in Ukraine, according to the UN chart, which, by the way, no one seems to respect anymore, is a clear violation of international law. But according to some, it would be possible to exclude Russia even though it doesn't have a coup d'etat or a civil war. The same thing had already been done with regard to South Africa in 1974. 
At first, the Security Council rejected a resolution to suspend the African country, requested as a measure in response to the apartheid regime, in case you were asking, vetoed by the US, France and the UK. Nevertheless, the General Assembly symbolically refused to approve the South African credentials to the point of deciding to no longer admit the South African delegation to the Assembly, at least until 1994 with the end of apartheid. And here we should stress the sentence, don't try this at home. Maybe the safest way to solve the UN dilemma is for the suspension to mature within the council itself, which is obviously impossible at the moment. And finally, the question we can help but ask ourselves is, who knows what Chavez would have done with his little guitar? Or Gaddafi with his uninterrupted monologue of an hour and a half? Perhaps to find a way out of this quagmire, it takes just the right amount of madness. Ciao!